let us see what we are doing. There we go. I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to have some uh, visitors today. We might have the biggest art group meeting we've ever had because we've invited some of the students from the um, experimental design and analysis class. We'll see how many forward thrusting young scholars come to join us today. That will be very interesting to me. So 2.6 ANOVA, let's see what we've got. Yes, it's the Cactus Lab. This is my favorite boot camp page today. I'm going to give people just another minute to join like I usually do. It's two minutes after now. Just going to pull this out of the way here. See who is continuing to send me emails. I'm just going to close my old email. <clears throat> okay. Now, who do we have in here? Let me just take a little bit of a look at the list. Still growing. A few people are joining. It's fine. Now, um, as you know, I like to um, pose my model of how the world works with these meetings and all of these online meetings and other kinds of meetings that I attend and compare that to challenge it with the data that I have about how the world is actually working. So I want to say what I think we're doing today. I think we all agreed to do a particular thing today. What I think we agreed to do is um, I think we agreed all to go ahead and try to run the code for the analysis of variance lab and um, to work through the, the workbook and then to do some live coding and spend our time together answering those problems at the end of the lab. That's what I think we agreed. Is that uh, what everybody else thinks we agreed? <laughs> Yes, OK, good. So um, <clears throat> what I usually do in these days is I often uh, will go through and, and talk a lot, and sometimes I'll do some live coding. And I thought, uh, even though it's the last boot camp page here on One Way Anova, that I would try not to talk as much as I usually do and try to spend the time just doing code which uh, people seem to like a lot. So, um, you know, this page is on one way analysis of variance. I will indulge myself and tell you a little anecdote. I just mentioned it. It's in the fresh in my mind because I mentioned it in uh, one of the chat channels over there. There was a question about one way Nova might have even been about this boot camp page. And um, I actually did my undergraduate degree in uh, zoology. I was and still am, as as many of you know, very interested in the natural world, love animals, love turning over logs to this day. Not I love birds and mammals. I love insects. I love reptiles and frogs. I, I like plants, too. They're OK. But <clears throat> when I entered uh, my professor's lab to do my my undergraduate research project, um, the person that I was working with, the professor, was uh, really hot on statistical skills. And I, and I think that he um, contributed a lot to going on and, and um, you know, studying statistics and using it like I do now. Excuse me, just one moment. I need to close my office door. <clears throat> And um, when I finished collecting all my data and I was um, trying to figure out how to analyze it, uh, you know, it won't be surprising since I'm telling you this anecdote that uh, the way that I was going to analyze it was with a one way ANOVA. And um, I did an experiment on mealworm beetle larvae, mealworm, mealworms, uh, and the effect, the toxicity effect of a bioorganic chemical on stunting their development. You may have even heard of the um, the chemical I, I used in my own undergraduate project. It's a 
natural chemical from a tree that's popularly called the neem tree, neem. The chemical is called azadiractin. And um, I brought this data, I was so happy, I did quite a large experiment and I might have had about um, four or five different treatment levels for my factor, which was the application of neem. And I, I probably had about 20 or 30 observations of each factor level, which were individual worms that I measured through their development and, and measured their ultimate developmental trajectory. And um, I had done a calculation of um, of this using some software. I don't even remember what software it was. It was this was I think R existed then, but I didn't know about R then. And um, I took the results. I was quite happy. I, I think there was a strong strong result I was quite happy about. And I was quite proud also of just having analyzed the data on my own. And he he uh, looked at me when I showed him the results. And he said, well, um, that's all, that's nice, uh, but how do you know that's correct? And um, well, I, I couldn't answer. I didn't know how I knew it was correct. I, I just trusted the software and I probably fumbled around and said something like that. And he said, well, that's all good, but it's not really good enough for for working, uh, for my way of working. You know, I, I think that I would like you to uh, calculate that by hand and just double check your calculation. And of course, this was his way of, um, you know, inviting me to uh, to understand a little bit about how one way ANOVA worked, about how it worked. You know, I was just taking a blind leap of faith. So when I was writing this lab, um, I thought about that that lesson that I learned. It was very unpleasant, of course. I actually did the whole hand calculation, um, writing out the steps. Um, I did it three times in total because I did make calculation errors the first two times, and I did it perfectly and came up with exactly the same answer as the, the software on my third attempt. <clears throat> I never have forgotten the lesson. It was a little bit cruel of the professor and everything, but I did learn quite a lot from it. And, I remembered that when I was writing this page, uh, and as part of it, I went through this exercise of uh, actually calculating some of the intermediate steps in one-way analysis of variance. And so, uh, you know, I did this in R code. It's not actually doing it by hand, but um, it might be interesting to you to do that. So some of you may have written that code. Uh, it's what I did at by hand as an undergraduate. <laughs> um, what we've agreed to do this afternoon is to um, to go down and to look at the questions. And um, I think we agreed that we would look at the uh, practice exercises and, and do them ourselves. Now, uh, we could do this in one of a couple of ways. <clears throat> one way we could do it <clears throat> is I could invite, you know, you guys to share your screen. And um, I'm not going to throw anybody into the um, alligator pit. We can work on this as a group and just talk through the solutions to all the uh, questions. I think that would be a good way to do it. Be a little bit of practice, live coding, if someone would would be willing to do that. <clears throat> I'm worried that if I just offer to share my screen that I won't be able to constrain myself and I'll I'll type the answers and um, it might be more fun if we work on the answers together and give somebody else a chance to share their screen. So um, what I think I'll do is I will start with um, in my own R console and I'll take the first step and I'll I'll show what I intended with uh, this data structure that I've posted here. So I'm um, just going to copy that. I was using this um, little tool in R when I made these pages that recreates the structure of a, of a data frame and allows you to recreate the structure of the data frame. So um, I've just copied that and I'm gonna go over to R. Is uh, is Anna by chance in the in the chat today? I don't see her. Um, 
I was just going to mention that I she sent me some data and uh, I did work on it and this is it. I was working on it between sessions today, but I'm just going to clear everything <clears throat> like I like to do. And I'm going to start a new script like I like to do. I'm just going to start a new one. And um, I'm going to set it up in the usual fashion with a header. And I'm going to make it a little bit bigger so everybody can see. Now, uh, if you share your screen in just a moment, um, you either can follow me right now and set up your own header and script, or um, you might uh, you you might um, already have one set up, which is fine. Or you can download one of the template scripts that I often upload on our on our page and look at it that way. So I like to put in um, who, I like to put in what, and I like to put in when, as you know. So who is my good self, what is <clears throat> bootcamp 2.6, glorious one way ANOVA. And uh, when is right now, Let's just put that in international date format, shall we? Uh, it's 11, and I think today is the 10th. So I'm going to make some contents. And you know that I like to put a setup section. And I like to put um, probably the questions one at a time. If we. Uh, if we do it, I would set it up something like this, and then I would just recycle that code. Recycle this little bit of code. A few spaces. There we go. My, I like to put a couple of spaces between my code chunks. It's tidier, isn't it? Okay. So now the setup will entail um, pasting this this code chunk that will recreate a data called pest. And uh, let's let's see what I said. Now, for these exercises, run the code below to recreate the data object pest. 40 rows, two variables, with the variables called damage and treatment. So um, I didn't waste my breath giving much, um, whoops. I didn't waste my breath giving too much information about this data. I'm just going to run it. And uh, we should see it pop up in the global environment if I've pasted it correctly. Three, two, one. There we go. And uh, what I think the idea for this was <clears throat> is to um, <clears throat> actually don't remember. I'd have to look back at my my original script that I used in the in the um, boot camp markdown script. Um, I'm not going to waste the time to do that right now, but. Uh, I can't remember if this was a real data set or if it was um, a simulated data set that I that I made up just for the purposes of this. But the idea was um, a little bit similar, maybe even inspired. I, I can't remember from the experiment I just described to you with uh, mealworm larvae, where we have uh, the amount of damage, some quantitative measure of the amount of damage uh, in an experiment where there was um, a treatment. <clears throat> that consisted of uh, several treatment levels. There was a control level. There was um, uh, full of some um, kind of pesticide and uh, then a, an organic pesticide. And um, before we get to the questions, when I won't, if there's, there's undoubtedly one that asks us to make a graph, but uh, really we want to put a little bit of effort, make a good graph most of the time. So um, because we know we have a dependent variable that's continuous and a, uh, I see there's some questions in the old chat, but I forgot. Um, oh, did I? OK, I showed the code in the in the script, generated the data. So it is simulated. Wasn't trying to trick anybody. I thought I thought I probably did simulate it since I pasted it in there rather than giving a question. I have this as a digression. I'll allow myself 30 seconds of digression because I have this um, there's one philosophy of teaching the practice of statistics, which, as you know, 
I do. And uh, the philosophy is uh, is different than my philosophy. But I'm not against this other philosophy. It's just not the philosophy I've practiced. My philosophy is uh, to use real data whenever you can. And oftentimes it's, you know, you make a little simulated data set for some good reason. You know, that's fine. But I, I do like to use real examples, real data for all sorts of reasons. Um, there are some costs with doing that and some benefits. The costs are that real data tends to be filthy and ugly and it tends to have errors and it tends to be messy and it's hard to work with. That's the real world. It's, that's a cost because uh, it's it can be confusing. But a, a benefit is that it, um, you know, it has a real world story associated with it, which is it's nice for me. It's nice for students. The other philosophy is that you should never use real world data. One of the reasons is that uh, just like the the population of, of you guys in the um, in the meeting, we all come from different backgrounds. So if you pick one story, it locks in a particular kind of story and um, it it precludes other versions of, of a similar story. So if you give an example data set from a crop study, it might alienate the uh, entomologist or they might have no idea about the specifics. That usually doesn't matter, we say, when we teach statistics, but there you go. So the other philosophy is only use simulated data. It sidesteps the problem of messy data. It's very easy to recreate and contrive stories that are widely applicable, or you can just avoid the story altogether. That is a very strong theory. And if any of you have seen the, um, the free and open uh, um, statistics textbook that I suggest for the EDA module by Diaz, Diaz et al. It's OpenStax is a is a academic open access publisher, free publisher. Academics donate their work, and the the quality of the work is really really high. It's been funded a, um, by um, I think the National Science Foundation in America to make these textbooks. One version of that, the version that I gave you is the normal version of it. You know, I say the the normal version of it, um, but the other version of it is teaching with the simulated data sets version, te teaching with simulation. OK, that's my digression. Oh, I, I forgot to say the point of me telling you that is I kind of have a, a goal of uh, making an R package that does data simulation for reasonably complex data sets. Um, so on my long list of things to do. Um, OK, so let's look back at the old um, thing here. Now, here's a little bit of a description. Think of this data as the result of an experiment. Looking, I'll just make this a little bit bigger for everybody. Looking at the effectiveness of pesticide treatment on leaf damage. OK, OK, I explained myself. That's good. I'm very creative. I must have made all this up. Let us imagine that the experiment measured leaf damage, that's the variable damage, measured in millimeters squared, and that the plants were treated with one of four treatment levels, variant treatment with level control, half, full, and organic. <clears throat> okay, the experiment is, is of course designed to look at the overall effect of various treatments may have to reduce leaf damage relative to the controls. In addition, it is of interest to examine the effect of the organic treatment compared to the others, as well as that to the half and full. The experiment ran using 40 potted plants spaced one meter from each other in a greenhouse setting. Each treatment was randomly assigned to 10 plants. Onto each plant was placed five red lily beetles. Oh, red lily beetles. There is a picture of a beautiful red lily beetle, one of my favorite all-time beetles. Okay. <clears throat> if you've never seen one, get yourself some lilies. You can see them on your own lilies starting in the middle of the summer. OK. <clears throat> so question one, make a good appropriate graph representing the overall experiment. Show your code. Describe any trends in the data that are apparent from the graph, as well as an initial assessment of principal assumptions of one way ANOVA based on your single graph. OK, here's, here's the part where I might invite someone from the audience to share their screen. And to uh, talk about, I see a hand up in a bubble of seven. Who is raising their hand? Matt. 
Do you want to share your screen? Sure, yeah. Uh, unusually, I have to actually, um, work through the questions for this one, all except the very last one. Yeah. Um, cool. And, and I'll I tell you what I found um, quite easy about them was that most of the code seemed to be in the, uh, you know, in the boot camp earlier on. So if you if you see a lot of cut and paste, think, yeah, that that is what I've done then. But I did draw some jumps. Anyway, I'll share my screen. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. May I may I say mm. that mm. you're you're cutting and pasting, you're copying and pasting of the bootcamp code is exactly exactly the way that I I think that that code should be used. To, when we start using this stuff, we use template code, boilerplate code, and I'm really happy to hear you say that you used it that way. Okay, so here we go. Sharing, <clears throat> are we seeing now? Yes. That's okay. Fantastic. So, um, yeah. So, so I, I lifted this off. Obviously, changed um, the box plot to damage and treatment using the appropriate data set, and, and this is what it showed me. And, and straight away, um, my, my first reaction was, uh, oh, I reordered it so that control was on the. Oh, in fact, I think it was already on the left because it was alphabetical. But um, I put control on the left. Uh, so it seemed like. Yeah, the full and half treatment probably would um, prove to be significant, but not the organic, although I did qualify that by saying just for this sample size, it may be there's a much bigger sample, I guess it the, the, it might uh, it might prove to be after all. So that was just the initial first look, see. OK, an overall graph. Can we linger on this for just a moment? Because we can actually talk quite a lot about this graph. Um, I, I wanted to make a remark and maybe pose a question about the uh, different kinds of hypotheses we might ask with a one-way ANOVA. I can't even remember um, when I wrote the lab, <laughs> or when I wrote this bootcamp page, uh, exactly how I treated this, or, or indeed if I did rigorously treat it at all, but we could, you mentioned a couple of things that are jumping out at you at the graph. <clears throat> like the the difference between control and full and control and half. But um, we have several hypotheses, uh, statistical hypotheses that we can ask with a plain old one way ANOVA. And one is just the hypothesis is overall. Is there an overall difference of treatment? And uh, it's not a specific difference. It's just, is there any difference between overall the means of the treatment levels. And based on this graph, what does it look like? Well, I'm, I'm saying yes. Overall, yeah, there's a big difference. There's a real big difference. And um, then a second kind of hypothesis we can ask with one way ANOVA is um, we can do so called post hoc tests where we um, ask if there are individual pairwise differences between the means. Yeah, you, you jump forward to question five with that. OK, so we'll we'll come back to that then. So it also does look like we have something going on with that. Did uh, would anybody um, care to to um, are we happy with this graph? W what if we wanted to make the best box plot we could? Are we happy stopping here? Is there any way we could uh, improve the information content of a basic Box plot. Can we linger on that for just a moment? I hear you speaking, Sophie, but your volume is very soft. Is there any way you could um, turn 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 your mic gain up or put your mouth closer to the mic? Better now. It's a little bit better. Still very faint. If we're all really quiet, we might be able to hear you. What do you have to say? What did you say? Um, to kind of put some dots on for the outliers. Oh, yeah. Yeah, put on the data points. That, that would be my first one as well. Do we, um, do we know how to do that? Does anybody um, have, a, have a way of doing that? Do you know how to do it, Matt? I don't know. I don't. I know it was in one of the examples in a previous uh, thing, but I don't. I don't. Let's overlay it real quick. If you'll accept some code from me, we can yeah. just underneath the box plot um, mm. code. We can use the uh, strip chart 
code strip chart function. Am I typing or are you sending something in chat? Would you like me to send something in chat? It might, be, might prove quicker. <laughs> might be better. I'll, I'll let me uh, get something from a because um, there are quite a few arguments actually. Um, yeah, I see some people in chat um, plot the actual data points with jitter. Charlotte says that's exactly what I have in mind. Separate the data points slightly so they don't directly overlap. Yep, that, that yep that does the jitter exactly. So I've got a the my normal way of doing it. There are several ways of doing it, but um, here is I'll send you some code. We're gonna have to edit this so that it works on yours, but it's from a different script. Here it comes in the chat. See it? <clears throat> okay, got it. Now you want to change the formula to your formula. Okay, so. Uh, delete the tillage. Yeah. Change your data. Data equals pest for you. Yeah. Um, you want to remove that ylim argument. <clears throat> okay. Just completely delete this line. No, there's three arguments on that line. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just the ylim argument. Okay. And uh, let me see. Um, and remove that at argument. So the comma on the second to the last line as well. Yeah. Okay. Mm hmm that that should work. Okay. <clears throat> there you go. Sometimes okay. if I'm feeling particularly sassy, I might make those dots red or something like that. But the, I think that does add a lot to it. Um, okay. Anything try, else? Color, color equals gold, goldenrod. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> goldenrod is even better. Thank you. <clears throat> My favorite color. Ooh, love that color. Did I do that right? Yep. Need a comma. Oh yeah. <clears throat> if you redraw the box plotter, it'll draw goldenrod dots over the top of those dots. Uh, okay. Oh. <clears throat> Something has happened. Is, did I spell goldenrod right? Is it a real thing? Yeah, it's a real thing. No, but I mean, did I do it right? Uh, <clears throat> uh, maybe let's try C-O-L C -O instead of C-O-L-O-R. Uh, it's complaining about the color. There you go. Yeah. Nope. No. 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 Take those away. There you go. See if that works. <clears throat> yeah. There we go. Beautiful. Just, just whilst we're here, what, what was... Um, what was what was this remark? I didn't quite understand that. Oh yeah. Um, <clears throat> let's um, if you just draw that box plot again. Just uh, just draw the box plot, not the strip chart. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, what happens with um, with a normal box plot? is that um, there are a couple of rules for drawing it and and the passive aggressive butler does a little thing a few little things without your permission that always right gets right on my back i don't like that at all as you know if you remove uh why don't you um remove that argument just mm -hmm. cut it so that you can paste it back also all the way to the comma <clears throat> and redraw it and you'll see what i'm talking about there uh no i actually don't see can you no, just uh, click the broom and um let's redraw it fresh um what i what that comment was probably for i don't know why it's not displaying but what the box plot does by default <clears throat> is uh the the whiskers of the bot the the box boundaries itself 
Mm. The up and down box boundaries that are shaded gray, they have a particular jargon name and they're they're called the hinges of the box. And they're the 25th and 75th quartile. So they're yeah. the enter 50% of your data. The the um, the other um, whiskers of the box they're called is either the range of your data or if you have um, a data point that is outside of the 95% confidence interval, it uh, it will the hinges will go to the 95% confidence interval and then by default it will it will plot the point that's the outlier outside. Yeah. Maybe there just aren't any. Maybe I, I must have said that for some reason. We could yeah. simulate one because it might be nice to show this. Why don't you go up to your data set there? Scroll up and let me see the um can I can you click up in your uh, oh I can probably just do it myself even easier. And I'll give you the um the code to do it. In pest, let me see if we if I'm looking at your X full, I'm gonna make I'm gonna make a fake outlier in X full and I'm gonna make one that says um like uh like maybe something like this. Let me just put it in my own, um, in the chat here. If you execute this code that says something like pest dollar sign uh, damage uh, bracket 21, that's the X full, close square bracket, and into that you put 100, like that. Execute that and redraw that box plot. <clears throat> it's making a fake outlier in my fake data. Mm -hmm. Just so we can demonstrate this point, because this really is a, it's like a little pet peeve of mine. If you want to wind me up, give me a box plot with a bunch of ugly outliers all over it. There you go. Now make your box plot again. There you go. Uh -huh. See how that little point is is up there now. Now, if you set the CEX argument to zero, <laughs> it'll, it'll it's not on my uh, it's not on my clipboard anymore. Was it CEX equal to zero? It just equals zero. Okay. What that does is it sets the size of those symbols <laughs> to zero. Ah. Uh, it's a tricky little way to uh, get what you want. Okay, let's just uh, it's just really annoying here. Yeah. Oh my God. Look that, that. Does that make so, you feel it's an abomination? <laughs> It's an abomination. I mean, uh, th we've removed it there. It wouldn't be under normal circumstances. Um, it would be, you know, deceptive to actually hide your your filthy outlier data point. But the whole point of removing it there is that we add it back on with the strip chart. So if you add, if you run that strip chart code, you'll see that it adds it back on. Oh, sorry. I, uh, I just reset the date. Did you want me to put your bad point back in? Yeah, put the bad point back in so we can yeah. see how that that looks. And now draw the strip chart on it. Oh, see, it, it puts it back on there anyway. So yeah. um, you would only want to do that if you were being honest and putting your data back on. One of one of the uh, there is another way to draw data like this. This is also a it it is a pet peeve of mine. I'll just be honest with you. I don't like to do it in some some scientific fields. Um, it's their it's their practice to do a, a different way of graphing one way ANOVA. And it really actually irritates me as a reviewer. Have you guys ever heard the joke about how mean reviewer two is? Well, if you, if you want some mean reviewer two comments from me, you would do something like this for your one way ANOVA. And that, that's that they, they calculate the mean of their actual data. And then they make a bar plot that looks all perfect. And then they'll put something like the standard error for the errors. And it's very deceptive because it, it hides the uh, real variation in your data, whereas it, this could be exactly the same as this data here that we're looking at. But now we have full information. It's honest. OK, let's go on. <clears throat> let's test the Gaussian assumption. Talk us through it, Matt. Uh, OK, so um, doing analysis of variance, uh, assigning M1 as the result of that. Then uh, 
what we're doing. Then we're using M1 uh, just to plot a histogram, first of all. <clears throat> and there we go. Not quite sure why it's gone all bunched up like that. Um, strange. Oh, <clears throat> you've got that MF row. Is that what you mean? The, 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 the this histogram when I did it before was yeah you know, sort of filled my plotting area, but now it's okay. Yeah. It, well, if you change that line, oh, because one two because ah uh, uh, yeah because of course it again I lifted this straight from your code in the tutorial part, so it's waiting for the second plot to be yeah put exactly here. okay yeah. so um uh, yeah th this this was the thing I had to add car by the way to get this plot thing to work for some reason earlier. Uh, let's just try it again now. OK, mm -hmm. yeah, so they were the two sort of visual checks on Gaussianness. That's yeah. a word. Yeah. Yeah, we can use that as a word. We're amongst friends. <laughs> um, I mean, uh, let's look at the histogram first. Does that look Gaussian to you? A mm, little bit left skewed. A little bit skewed, yeah. That's not, not left skewed, sorry, no, it's the other way, isn't it? It's, it's, right, it's right skewed, yeah, you would normally say it's right skewed. Yeah, it looks a little bit hunched. Mm. It, um, it's it got the one, it's not quite symmetrical either, <clears throat> because it's got the ranges between negative, most of the data ranges between negative two and positive two, except for that one guy that's out there at four. Yeah, so I think that might be your guy, actually. Oh yeah, it probably is actually. Why don't we go? Why don't we go put in the data and then look at this again? Yeah, my little yeah. my little fake outlier is uh, causing trouble. Uh, yeah, that's right. So this this was your code that produced the random. Oh thing yeah, using yeah. the set seed forty two, so it's the same random every time. Yeah, and this, yeah. Is, this is what it produces. Uh, so I don't want to run that again by accident. Get rid of that. Uh, so I just want to do my this again yeah um, and then i can produce all of this did i run it no uh, nope it's that's just nope it didn't run uh yeah i think it did it run yeah it's just oh so maybe that was there before then that uh oh no it shouldn't have been there oh no. um, something something dubious has happened okay let me check let me check i didn't didn't um, skip over something when I did this. So, uh, yeah, so I wonder was... if you. I wonder if it made the. Um, I think you skipped line two five nine. Oh, I did. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, probably. Let's try again. So what, what I was going to do to check that, I was just going to do RM uh, pest. Is it? Uh, oh yeah, to remove it. To remove it. Yeah. Well, you could you could nuke oh. everything in the. Um... Oh, that's not the right sort of. Uh... Oh, it's uh, it's curly braces at oh, the sorry, end. My site's going on the flipping keyboard. Uh, how do I not know where curly braces are? Uh, straight braces. Yeah, oh, there's still a, a curly brace in the console down there. There we go. Whoop. More than I need now. Oh, I see. I got it. There you go. Cool. So then if I can run. Run that again. Reproduce it for sure. Yeah. And all right, this is going to look like the sweetest Gaussian distribution you've ever seen, right there. Okay. And then. Oh yeah, that's a lot better. <laughs> no outliers. <laughs> now, does that look Gaussian to you, guys? Anyone in the chat want to give us an opinion about that? Do we need a, a second opinion on that? I reckon it does. Yeah? Mm. That would have made um, Gauss cry if he saw that, I think. Oh, we've got a dissenter. Juliana isn't keen. No, Juliana doesn't like it. Okay. Let's, let's, have, a, let's have a look at the, um, at the so, graph again. So Hell no. <laughs> Hell no. That's what I, that's what I like to hear. Some dissenting oh, well, opinions. Yeah. See, I, I I put my trust in Shapiro Wilkes. Is it that guy? Yeah. 
can uh, do that, but let's just have a look back at it before okay. we result to the stats mm -hmm. test. Let's have a look at the old thing. I mean, um, what we want when we see Gaussian is a nice, perfect bell curve. But uh, remember, this is um, simulated filthy world data, real okay. world data. And, and it's only 40. 40. It's only 40. Yeah, this is sampling error. And um, we, we know, in fact, that this this is Gaussian because uh, Matt has <laughs> Matt has simulated it from a from a Gaussian distribution. So we, we know it actually does come from a perfect Gaussian distribution. Sampling, I agree with you, Jessica. It, it um, God, it looks terrible. But um, if you'd seen what I have seen, you would embrace that as as fully Gaussian and accept a little bit of sampling error. Should I try it with a different seed? Um, you, yeah, you can. We can see how it changes. Sure, it will change a little bit, but um, it'll it'll still look like it has uh, sampling error. With a just you pointed it'll it be, out, it'll be just different a small, sampling error, won't it? Hopefully, yeah, this will be different. Let's see what how it changes it. <clears throat> Uh, do you want to do the countdown, Ed? <laughs> yeah, three, two, one. <laughs> yeah, it looks a little, this one's worse than the other one. <laughs> <laughs> no returns. Uh, um, let's look at the um, the QQ plot. Now, this one's kind of nice because it, what this shows is it's the, um, it's the, the density of residuals against, um, the quantiles of of where the the regression should be we're at perfect gaussian and we're look thanks that looks better what we can see on this is that there are a few low residuals um lower than we expect and uh we you know if it's perfect gaussian they should all sit right on the line and what we're looking for is systematic divergences at the ends usually or systematic divergences of some point there are a few outliers in this, but with a small sample size, to me, this is perfectly acceptable. But don't take my word for it. Let's run that Shapiro test. So um, now th this, we just had a conversation um, before we came over to this R meeting about the funny way that we use some statistical tests. And th this testing of the Gaussian distribution is one of the um, like philosophically troublesome um, practices in uh, in the the basic practice of statistics. And let me let me talk you through that. F first, let's in, let's interpret this test and let's talk about what our hypothesis is. What what is our hypothesis that we've tested with that Shapiro test? Is anybody willing to put that into their own words? Is it that there's no difference between the Gaussian distribution and the distribution of your sample? Yeah, that's that's the null hypothesis. Exactly. That's right. And um, with the, here's the dubious part that takes a little bit of thinking to uh, to wrap your head around <clears throat> is that uh, for a normal statistical test, we think the alternative hypothesis is true and we, we hypothesize that the null is false. But uh, for for this kind of test, <clears throat> it's a little bit the opposite, isn't it? We um, we uh, want to take failing to reject the null as evidence that the null is true. Let's think about that for a second. Does that make sense to everybody? What I just said? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> like uh, like Too let's say that we're negatives. Let's let's say that we're um. Let's say that we're doing a regular statistical test, like uh, like the effect of the um, of the uh, one-way ANOVA and the amount of damage according to our our um, treatments. And we let's say we get a very small p-value. Our null value there is that the mean damage is the same. And uh, if the p-value is very small, we reject the null and say actually the damage is not the same. And before we did the experiment there. We uh, we believed that our treatment would have an effect on how the world works, 
you know, that's why scientists do experiments. And uh, we would have rejected the null. And when we posed the null, we would have actually believed the alternative hypothesis was the true one. Here, testing this assumption uh, on the residuals, we we probably actually believe the null is true. You know, we would if if we are measuring some data uh, to see if it um, adheres to the Gaussian and that it came from a Gaussian population. And when we measure continuous variables like this, you know, we do expect them to come from the Gaussian distribution. In this case, we believe the null is is true. We've tested it to reject the null, and we. Uh, we we don't reject the null, but but actually, the degree to which we can detect deviations from the null hypothesis in in all statistical tests depends on both whether there is a difference, and also uh, how big that difference is, and our ability to detect that further depends on how big our sample size is, and here our sample size is fairly small, and so if there's a a little divergence between Gaussian and non-Gaussian, the bigger our sample size is, even given that there is a little difference, the bigger our sample size is, the uh, more likely we are to detect that difference and reject the null. But here, with any old cut size of sample, we, uh, we've tested whether there's a divergence between Gaussian and our data. Our p-value is big, and so the question here it boils down to is it's a philosophical one that has to do with the tools in the practice of statistics. Um, by <clears throat> by having a big p -val value, does that mean that the null is true, or does it mean that we fail to reject the null for lack of evidence? Those are very different things. One is evidence that the null is true. Simple enough. One is we don't have enough evidence to reject the null, so the, the null may or may not be true. It's actually that second one that we're at, but we, we treat this kind of test like it's the first one. <laughs> we usually <laughs> accept the null as, as true in this case. OK, that's a digression. Let's go on. <laughs> OK. So OK, then, so we're happy enough to carry on. Um, we're happy enough that this is not different to the null. Does, does the size of this, I mean, is the maximum one here? And does that, what would that mean? <clears throat> um, I, uh, I can't remember what the Wilkes W maximum is. I think it can go higher than, than uh, one. But the the mag for any test statistic in this kind of um, test, the there usually is a range, and the the range is arbitrary. What the actual number means is arbitrary. It only makes um, sense relative to the distribution of values that it can take. So, with a test like this, um, we almost never can directly interpret the the test statistic directly because it depends on a lot of things like the sample size. Right. So, th so that leads to this question. This was sort of my first answer, if you like, and I didn't put the p-value or anything. And what would the correct way to word this be? Yeah, I would I would say you, you've said it correctly. I would probably personally say it's something like, uh, uh, let me say how I might say it to interpret the test, and then let me say how scientists would report it in a paper, let's say, or a report. <clears throat> how I would say it is I, I would say that uh, there's no evidence that our sample residual distribution is different to uh, Gaussian. That's how exactly how I would say it myself. We would usually report this by um, very, um, very cursorily <laughs> when we reported we'd probably say that we uh, we tested assumptions of adherence to Gaussian and we'd probably also throw homoscedasticity into it and uh, and uh, our data adhered to assumptions and we probably would not even report it in an actual scientific paper they rarely do okay cool so you mentioned that long word I'm not going to try and uh, say it there's a there's actually in a scientific article that um, tells you how to pronounce that word, Matt. I'll send that to you. 
<laughs> Almost sk skedasticity with a hard C. <laughs> skedasticity, okay. Yeah. Um, right, so uh, what did we do? So we, we plotted to have a quick, uh, quick look see about it. And uh, yeah, so it's a visual check. So I guess the dots are one for each. Um, category. Uh, what, what other categories? No. Uh, yeah, you had. Oh yeah, for organic, full, half, and control. Is that is that right? Is that what represent these? It's exactly right. Yeah. I mean, for this one, we again we had a conversation before we came over here. What are we looking for? What is homoscedasticity first? Uh, willing to put that into their own words. Not necessarily you, Matt. You're taking all the heat from okay. having to type in public, but uh, just open to the channel. Who would like to say that in their own words? Is it when um, the, res the residuals are all an equal distance from the line? Not directly equal, but obviously closer. There's like a diagram to explain it. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Does anybody, could anybody put it another way or give us a little more? Would it be like the spread of the residuals is consistent throughout um, the data values? Yeah, that's a good way to put it. It's it's that the variance is the same across the, the fitted values. Are we, do we expect it to be exactly the same? So it's, it's really that it's similar across <laughs> the predicted values. Let's see that. Let's see that graph again, Matt. So um, <clears throat> one kind of pattern that we sometimes see on a graph like this um, is that <clears throat> is that uh, we see a we see a pattern across the fitted values. Like uh, one thing that would be a warning here is if if the the uh, spread of those dots was very different between the four different places that they show up. That would be a warning sign. And uh, we do see a little bit of differences, but um, this one here is fine to me. Um, most of the dots are between about positive 1.5 and negative 1.5. Would, would everybody kind of agree with that? There are one or two that are outside that. But um, that's kind of what we're looking for. We're looking to see that the um, this is an informal way to to look for whether there's a pattern. The pattern might be across the fitted values that there's a, an increase or it might be a decrease. And uh, I call I call those patterns the horn of terror. We never want that. That will cause a systematic bias in our predictions that we make. OK, let's go on. I see we've already used up most of our time. This has been fun. So me not um, talking the whole time is fun, but I have been talking most of the time. <laughs> So, so this this just loads on some blue dots. And I'm, I'm, I, to be honest, I don't quite understand why we do this, because they always seem to end up on that red line, which doesn't tell us very much. <clears throat> um, yeah, they sh they they should, but they don't they don't actually have to land right on the line. They uh, in this case with a with a an ANOVA because they're factors, they will be centered on the lines. And so they always will appear on the lines. But when we use this kind of diagnostic plot for different kind of models, um, they'll migrate. So, uh, okay. yeah, it's it's not that interesting on this one. I mean, that's, that's the hazard of cut and paste without realizing quite yeah. why you're doing it. OK, so the Barlet test. Uh, again, it's just about interpreting the results, isn't it? So yeah, what, what is this question? What is this one? Bartlett's test. Yeah. <clears throat> So it's just a formal test of whether or not those variances between the different um, different factor levels differ. So it's, we're using this slightly incorrectly in exactly the same way we use the test for Gaussian. <laughs> so what does this mean? P-value big. Uh, it means we can't say that it it isn't homogeneous. Yeah, we we uh, the null here is that there is 
There's no difference in variance between the factor levels. Here we, we fail to reject the null, so there's no evidence of a difference. Okay, so all so far so good. Okay, uh, there's a one way over. And summary of. Uh. Okay, so um, you'll see if you watch the, um, I guess for the students in the EDA class, I have a like a rather long discourse about what an ANOVA table is. <clears throat> but this thing that's put out with the summary of an ANOVA object um, it's a little bit confusing in R, but um, but we we actually calculate formally if we look at all of the thing. I also explained this in some lectures. I'm, I can't remember how much I explained it in the boot camp here, but <clears throat> if we look at what we call a linear model, it includes analysis of variance and simple linear regression. They're all linear models, and analysis of variance is a specific kind of linear model, and uh, we. We use the AOV function analysis of variance in R to calculate it in, in ANOVA. But the way we usually summarize the results of a linear model, at least um, the uh, one way to do it, is, um, is with an ANOVA table. And we have uh, an ANOVA table here where we have some, it's arranged in columns and rows. We have one row per um, parameter that we estimate in the model. And here, in, like in simple linear regression, we estimate two parameters. One is the, um, the parameter for the treatment, <clears throat> and one is the parameter for the residuals. And we, we only um, calculate it uh, in a classic ANOVA table for one-way ANOVA. There's only one p-value that's asking the hypothesis, overall, is there a mean that uh, we can explain uh, a difference amongst the treatment levels due to that factor treatment. <clears throat> so uh, we and we get a few summary statistics that we would report. Typically, we get the um, the numerator and denominator degrees of freedom. The numerator degrees of freedom is the number of factor levels minus one, so three, and the denominator degrees of freedom is the um, the uh, number of samples that we have, the, the data points that we have, minus uh, one per treatment level. <clears throat> so it's four treatment levels, 40 data points, minus four is 36. So we have the F value, the F ratio is the F statistic, and, um, and then the P value in scientific notation. And uh, it used to be 30, 40 years ago, you would see ANOVA tables published in scientific articles, but we don't we don't use them anymore. Uh, and I give plenty of examples on how to report this stuff uh, on the bootcamp pages. So that's good. And we have another one here. What is the other one? Damage. Okay, it's this linear model. And th this one gives us the. Um, Remember what this it, it, split, it splits, splits them out, doesn't it, into uh, the individual treatment groups. Does anyone remember what this way of what this kind of table is called? A contrast table. It's, it's a contrast table, yeah. This one has one line per contrast, and it, this really does fit a uh, theoretical linear model. What it does for every line, <clears throat> um, here there's just one factor. So there, there should be, um, for every factor, there should be one uh, line, which is the number of levels minus one for that factor. And so for here, there are three, there are four lack factors. And uh, Matt set the, well, maybe you did or maybe you didn't set the control, but alphabetically it's the first factor level. And you can set what your reference factor level is. Here the control is suitable. So we want to compare the other levels to our control. And we get one contrast test that compares each of those factor levels to the control. 
Matt, could I ask you to um, use your back arrow in the plots and go back to that box plot real quick while we're on this? Oh, oh doesn't, doesn't that, uh, I can quickly remake it. Yeah, um, re remake it real quick. That'll be cool. This is fine. And then let's just look back at the contrast table again. <clears throat> um. If we just scroll up, there we go. So what this says is that relative to the control treatment, there's a statistic test for the treatment level organic. That's the first line. We usually ignore the intercept. It's not a it's not usually interesting to us. That's whether or not um, the um, <clears throat> the um, that's the mean of the of the the reference level, uh, whether it's different to zero. And so the control mean is different to zero. That's not very interesting to us in this. But the uh, treatment organic one is a test of the difference between the organic level and the control. The estimate is the magnitude of that difference. So it's minus 5.06 units of damage, millimeters of damage. And uh, we look out at the p-value and it's it's big, it's 0.32. So it's there's no evidence it's different to zero, that difference. So the from the sample, it's minus five, but statistically there's no difference. And likewise, if we look at the full and the half, we can see the estimates of the um, the difference between control and full and control and half. And uh, we can see they're both highly significant. Yeah, so I, I concluded and then looking at the difference to the control, I thought it was worth it doing a post hoc to see <clears throat> their relationship to each other using yeah. this fella. Yeah, cool. Uh, which uh, did show uh, what we expected, really. Yeah, these are um, lo people love to do these postdoc tests, and they are sometimes useful. So uh, what this one does is, uh, let me just look and wrap my head around it. I'll, I'll say out loud what I'm thinking. So we have four treatment levels. What I should expect to see is control to organic full and half. That's three. I should see organic to full and half. That's two more. And I should see full and half. That's six. And sure enough, we see six lines. So it's every possible pairwise comparison that's unique. And so uh, there's there's actually a difference. If I try to summarize this in my own mind, there's a difference between everyone except control and organic. So uh, we sometimes we would put little letters above there um we're out of time there is a little package that allows us that will actually spit out numbers that groups them but uh, we might put on top of control we might put a and on top of organic we would put a b because it's different to x full but it's not different to control so uh we'd put on top of control an a on top of organic an a b on top of x full we would put a b because it's um it's different to the a hmm, i think we actually need a c so we need a a c d i think is what we need there they're all different except control and organic hmm. okay cool. we're out okay. of time Anyone have any final comments? Let's stop that recording so it doesn't rattle on and go so long. <clears throat>